Hello everyone, thank you for joining this webinar organized by the EXFLU team of Dassault System Simulia. Uh, my name is uh, Zaki Abiza, I'm from the EXFLU business development team. Uh, in this webinar, my colleague Giuseppe Trapani, uh, an EXFLU application engineer, will present uh, the new features of EXFLU 2017X release, as well as the new integrated capabilities available with the with the some Dassault system product that we have uh, developed with this uh, release. Before I hand over to my colleague Giuseppe, I want to inform you that you can send us your questions during the webinar through the questions dialog box you have at the right of your screen. So just uh, feel free during the webinar to, to, to ask us your question. I will try to answer some of them during the webinar and some of them will be answered at the end of the presentation by Giuseppe in the, in the questions and answers session. Thank you again for joining us. I will let you now with my uh, my colleague Giuseppe. So so go ahead, Giuseppe. Perfect. Thank you, Zaki. And hello, everyone. And once again, thank you for joining us today on this webinar on introduction to Xflow 2017 X. Okay. Again, I'm Giuseppe Trapani, and I'm a senior application engineer in the Xflow team. And today, I'll guide you through the presentation of our latest release, Xflow 2017X. And as Zaki introduced earlier, we're gonna focus on some of the new capabilities introduced, uh, but mainly on the integration with other desktop uh, um, system products. So we're gonna see how we integrate with some of them and the different steps that we have in our integration um, plan. We also have a live demo. So we're gonna try to show you some of the capabilities of uh, the new release. And you're gonna see it's actually on one of these inter integration. So you can see live what's, what, what does it look like. And then we have a question and answer session as well. So please feel free to pop up your question in the question and answer box or in the chat box of your uh, GoToMeeting panel, okay? Perfect. So let's get started with the first um, part of the presentation, which is the new feature available in 2017X. And let's start with the multi-phase um, solvers. We already have a good variety of solar in, in Xflow, in particular the two that you are mentioning in, this, in the slides here. We have the particle-based tracking and the phase field uh, solver. And those are really complementary multi-phase solutions which apply on different scales. So they cover basically the needs of a multi-phase simulation in, uh, in Xflow. Now we're introducing a third one, which is the volume of fluid of off method. And it's actually somewhere in between the two ones already available in Xflow, okay? So it uses some of the techniques of the particle based tracking. So the interface is actually tracked in some way. It's not computed as a, an um, extra equation. Um, but it does have some advantages over, over the, the same of the particle based tracking. So for example, the pressure the field is computed on the entire domain instead of being applied as a boundary condition between the two phases, okay? And that gives some advantages on type of simulation where we need um, less noisy pressure field. And the solver is again uh, available as a, a lapse mode in our X for 2017X. Um, so the user will have to switch to lapse mode to use it. But as you can see from the slides, it says that it's adapted to large scale multiphase applications. So where the inertia forces are predominant over surface tension forces, okay? a little bit like the particle-based tracking one. Uh, we have to say that in this solver, the tension effects, surface tension, are better captured than the particle-based tracking, but it's still not as good as a phase field, and just because the scale that we're dealing with are completely different. So it's really a um, well, first step development of this new solution for the user to use um, and well test on the, on the specific cases. Okay, and now if we move from multi-phase to thermal simulation, we have a bunch of new development in the thermal solver. And we start with the top one, so number one, and it's the video that you can see on the right hand side of your slide. And there we have one of the new boundary conditions and it's a temperature jump. Um, we do have something similar in pressure, a pressure jump condition. So we well, ported that basically into the, the temperature field. So as you can see, some thin surface in, within this uh, cylinder simulation, which enforces a temperature jump from the left to the right-hand side of the, of the surface, okay? It does not need to have a thickness, so it can be a thin surface, and that will set your condition, okay? 
some people use it on some specific simulation where the well, they don't want to actually simulate the thickness and the change in temperature through the thickness of the geometry. So you can simplify your geometry in your simulation using the um, uh, temperature jump condition. Okay, that's more into the, well, within the fluid domain, let's say. We do have a further development which allows us to specify convection and radiation condition on the outer skirt of our domain. So imagine that we have the same cylinder simulation in here but we want to apply some sort of convection radiation condition on the boundaries of the external boundary of the domain, uh, trying to simulate basically the heating or the cooling of the environment around the cylinder. Okay. So we developed a new and implemented a new conditions, which is called convection radiation heat transfer. And you can apply that directly into the geometry, to the geometry, and simulate those heat transfer, which are well, either by convection or radiation, so you can select, the user can select the contribution. And as you can see from the plot at the bottom right, we're trying to simulate, in this case, an increase in temperature inside the domain. And if you set that condition uh, correctly and then you have the analytical solution, you can see the, well, the X-flow results are basically matching the analytical uh, solution for the specific case. Of course, that's a simple, uh, simple simulation. It's actually a sort of a, a cube, but you can see that the law is um, uh, correctly applied. And this boundary condition can be applied in a way to not actually solve the environment around the geometry you are interested in, but to mimic that effect as a convection radiation um, if parallel system. Okay, switching to number three, volume heat source. Um, again, you can see a typical application on the bottom left um, of your slide. And there you see, well, we are actually applying a volume, volume heat into a porous volume. So that's a kind of a radiator simulation. So if you have, for example, a car where you have a radiator and it's a porous media, so you have a pressure drop of the flow going through, you can now in an X-Flow 2017X add a volumetric heat source. So as you can see, we are plotting temperature in the video and we're going to have an increase in temperature on the entire volume of our um, porous media. And of course, that will actually extend on the on the fluid side. Okay, so in this case, we have a velocity inlet from the left hand side sweeping through the uh, the domain, and you can see how the temperature is then diffused, um, um, well, uh, downstream the the porous medium. Okay, so there is a good development for thermal analysis of, for example, in automotive industry. Okay, um, the third. Important um, introduction in Xflow 2017X is animated geometries, and that's something that's been in Xflow uh, developed for some specific solver, but we kind of revamped the uh, the feature in the latest release. Specifically, well, we extended the validity or the applicability of um, that feature on all the solvers that we have in Xflow. So, in this case, for example, you can see a video of a free surface simulation and it specifically is a non-Newtonian fluid, so trying to mimic toothpaste uh, simulation. And what the animated geometry allows you to do is to actually have a series or a sequence of geometries, so a set of meshes or surface tessellated geometries, as you can see here in .stl format. And if you have the, those series that represent basically the deformation of your geometry, you can then use this time sequence of geometry um, to rebuild the deformation of the object with a specific discretization in time inside Xflow and then use this deformation to drive the fluid flow. Okay, um, so in this case what we have is different time steps of our geometry, our toothpaste and the tube and we are while interpreting in time the deformation, and we are squeezing out the liquid which is inside our our tube. Okay, as you can see, some fluid structure interaction problem, um, but we are facing the one-way approach. So the fluid is actually you know, affected by the structure deformation, but not the other way around, because the structure deformation is actually imposed on our on our simulation. And you can see how the tube that deform the the tube, okay. On the left hand side you have just the geometry, on the right hand side you have the geometry and the fluid flow coming out. That's one of the application of such features. Um, moving to, well, probably a little bit less uh, fancy one, but really important ones, uh, for example, 
um, tires deformation. Okay, uh, what we're trying to convey in this slide is the message that well, we had few studies and few development on um, a conference in 2015 where they showed some advancement on simulating tire threads with simplified model. Um, we now try to go even into more details so we can say we can actually simulate the reality of how the tire deforms. So in that case, you can have a simulation in Apacus, for example, for your tire deformation, uh, export all these sequence of geometries, and then use that as a driver into the Xflow fluid simulation. Okay, um, you can imagine that we can use those type of uh, features in simulating moving tires, so the entire geometry with moving tires deforming over time. You can include as many details as you want, like the actual road geometry scan inside the simulation. We have the contact patch, which is the actual one, so it's not an approximation of the contact patch. And you can use those simulation to do, well, FSI, of course, vibroacoustics. But as we can see in the next slides, even water management. So if you want to see what um, or how does your tire perform in expelling the water uh, using the threads of the, the specific geometry. Uh, what we see in this slide is actually a plot of the wetted surface on the left-hand side and velocity vectors on the right-hand side. Okay, So we can see how the patch evolves over time and we have a tire that is pressed against the screen, so the tire is actually deforming uh, on the y-axis coming toward the screen. And we have a plot of the forces which the water actually applies on the, on the tire on the bottom part of the video. And as you can see, as you, we squeeze the tire, of course, we have fluid that goes through the threads. And well, there are high velocity regions, so the fluid is uh, actually evacuated from the, from the threads. And you can see the patch, the green patch, which develops, which is um, basically the place where water is gone because it's been expelled from the, uh, from, from the tire threads. And then the tire is actually pulled back. So then we have a release of these velocity vectors. Okay, so now simulations of, for example, tower or aqua planning might actually be feasible using uh, this technique. But we're going to see later on we can actually go farther than that. Um, we're going to see on some of the uh, coupling with the DES uh, technologies. So now changing in industry, uh, going from automotive to marine, um, we do have, for example, lots of simulation with our partner WB Sail, and they're doing really impressive simulation with moving parts, moving objects so pumping and rowing of the boats. Uh, but you can imagine to go even farther and well, set the sail as a deformable object. So you have some sort of history or some uh, pre-calculated deformation of the sail, and then you can input that into your simulation so you can actually calculate what's the thrust or the loads on the sail, not as a fixed object, but as an animated geometry, so as an object which actually deforms over time. Okay, of course that gives you more results, well, more realistic um, results on the loads that you're going to have and some of the effects of interaction between sales and, and the hull, for example. Okay, so now I'm moving from more what I define as feature or new uh, development to something which is a little bit more drastic in the Xflow uh, development, which is what we define Xflow 1. Um, now, Xflow 1 is basically an optimization of Xflow in terms of performance. So we're trying to squeeze the maximum from Lattice Postman method and we have been working on that for uh, the last year roughly. And what we're trying to do is actually optimizing the uh, specific Lattice Postman implementation of Xflow. What does it mean? Well, in general Lattice Postman is what we call a bandwidth limited uh, method. Um, that is it takes longer to actually access data, read and write, than computing something, okay? And the implementation usually is quite uh, simple. On the computation side, it's more the access of the data, which is a bottleneck. That is usually true for Lattice Postman, um, specific for the cascaded Lattice Postman method, which is what X4 uses um, as some sort. Um, it's actually a little bit, well, less com that's true, okay, it's a little bit more complicated to do some calculation, but 90% of the time is actually um, on memory handling. So the idea here is to try to optimize and maximize the memory bandwidth uh, in order to reduce, of course, um, runtimes, computation times. 
Um, we do have well, a specific development uh, branch on that, and we have one of our uh, best developer working on it. And he came up with a few uh, tips and um, well, tricks to reduce the memory usage and to maximize the bandwidth. Uh, for example, reducing the load stores um, operation, uh, being aware, well, or making a code is aware of the architecture of a NUMA configuration. So with multiprocessors, multicaching, and try to exploit that. And of course, uh, going to vectorization of the codes. So trying to well write a code which is a actually a really low level um, coding language, but exploits more the the actual architecture, the the hardware itself. Okay, so. The process actually starts from the very beginning. So if you're familiar with Xflow, you already know that Xflow is a lattice postman code and uses what we call a lattice. So a discretization of our domain, uh, mainly in points on space. And if you see this plot, you can realize that that's basically one of the cutting plane of Xflow, so where you can see one of the domains lies. That's what we call a point-wise structural refinement. So we can refine our simulation going from black to blue to red, this cotization lattice size. Um, but that is not optimal, probably minimizes the number of elements. But in terms of performance, it's not the optimal case. So what we move to is a different approach to the lattice generation, and that's what we call the block structure approach. So instead of creating just lattices, we create lattices, but bunched in boxes, in blocks. Okay, here you can see 16 blocks, for example, and when we start refining our simulation, then we create block to refine. It's not just point-wise refinement. Okay, so we have the blue refinement and then the red refinement. Um, as you can imagine, that increases slightly the number of elements. As you can see, a real case here on a, on a car, on a auto vehicle, um, but it does give you lots of performance advantages. So for example, if you apply this new developed um, Xflow on a simple case like a lead-driven cavity compared to the standard Xflow, we can see here, for example, a factor of 10 speed up, okay? That's a huge gain in performance. Um, of course, that's a simplified case. We have a uniform resolution, uh, roughly 130 million elements. And as you can see, while well, the scaling is per almost perfect, 90%. Um, efficiency in scaling in MPI, but you have a 10x overall from 28 to 250 cores, okay? So that's a really huge performance boost. Now, if you go to a little bit more realistic case, like the external chirodynamics I showed you earlier, of course, now the uh, lattice elements become, the structure becomes more complex. Still, we are around 100 million elements, and you can see we have a speed up anything between four and five, compared to a standard Xflow, which means a really big boost. Um, and then we start, well, dropping a little bit on MPI um, scaling. So the next step is actually to work on optimizing the MPI uh, parallelization on the new architecture. Okay, so that's a really interesting development coming on on this release. And it's already available for some specific uh, simulations, okay? It's not the entire Xflow scope. We just have some limitations, as you can see here. It has to be a 3D single phase isothermal simulation. There are some limitations on the function that you can use on the setup. So uh, for the current version, only constant values can be used. We do not have the ability to do moving geometries, but then we can basically do any or almost any external aerodynamic simulation, okay, using a default wind tunnel in Xflow. Of course, we're seeing really huge performance boost, so we want to port that to 2018, 2019. It's going to be to rewrite the entire Xflow um, feature, so from free surface to multi-phase to immersed boundary moving parts, and take advantage of this rewriting of the code and put a few inputs on, like some UDF, user-defined functions that can be actually compiled at execution time, so will allow the user to do some really interesting stuff uh, with Xflow, and one of the, well, my favorite probably is the server dispatches, so we still are working on a way to ease the, the life of a Xflow user, so that when it runs Xflow, automatically identifies what's the flow solver that it needs to use, and for example, if it has to choose between the legacy solver and Xflow 1, that can be done automatically by 
but executable. It doesn't have to be a choice of the of the user. Okay, that's a big well, short summary on the new capabilities that I wanted to show. You. And now I actually move to the integration with the salt products because I think we have really interesting uh, development coming on on this release. So I want to focus a little bit more on that at, and on the live demo. Okay. If you do have more questions, please don't forget to use the Q and A session on or later on or write that on the on the panel. Okay. Let's start with the first the salt product. Um, or Simpack. So what we developed is um, two-way coupling. Uh, with Simpack using the FMI standard functional mockup interface, um, which is basically a sort of independent uh, library or standard, and tries to support co-simulation data exchange between different solvers um, softwares. Okay, the configuration as you can see on the right hand side is a sort of master and slave, and in this case Simpack is the one that actually handles the master, so it's the, the master that calls Xflow in order to get the forces that it needs to, com to do the computation. And all this information is exchanged using some libraries and FMI wrappers, okay? Uh, but it really the user doesn't have to do anything else than set up the simulation and run it. What happened is, well, we're exchanging, like in this case, um, forces from Xflow to um, uh, Simpac, and the other way around, the motion of the motorcycle from Simpac back to Xflow. And that is done a uh, determined time step, so the frequency can actually be chosen by the user. Um, one limitation, while well, we are actually exporting concentrated loads, so it's not a load distribution or a surface um, force distribution, but concentrated loads on specific points, which are probably the arrows that you see in the Simpac simulation. So those forces actually come from, from Xflow. And the idea behind this simulation is we have a motorcycle on a crosswind. So you can see that there is a wake that comes from to the left-hand side of the rider. And of course, the cycle, the motorcycle will tend to deviate from the perfect straight line. And Simpark is trying to actually correct that, okay, and sending back the information to Xflow. So as you can see, that's a multi-body simulation with some sort of control of the of the riding line. Okay, um, let's jump to the second tool that we couple with Xflow, and is um, the Salt System or Simulia CST solver. And what we basically do is take the electromagnetic simulation of CST, calculate the uh, heat sources that that produces, and then import that into Xflow. Now, compared to the previous integration, that's more a one-way coupling. Okay, so we read the results from CST into Xflow, uh, but we do not exchange anything back to CST. Okay, so that's why the lines or the arrows are going one way. So um, we had two developments that basically enables this um, kind of integration, and one is the possible definition of a volumetric heat source. That now is possible to do that into Xflow, and the second one is a specific development which is a sort of a new function that um, users can use to read into Xflow VTK VTU mesh data, okay? So the, a custom user know that they can use functions in Xflow to define input lows or velocity lows or motion lows. And now we have a specific function um, that can be used to read um, unstructured data. And that's the syntax that you can see on the top of your slides. So if we use this unstructured mesh function, we can read this uh, file name and then use the input information as an input for Xflow simulation. Okay. The example we're seeing on this slide is actually a sort of heat source on a structure mesh that you can see on the left hand side coming from CST. And then we are reading this mesh and this heat source into Xflow and we are simulating that into a um, periodic box. Okay, you can see that at the beginning we are reading and interpolating the simulation from the unstructured mesh to our lattice, and then we are simulating that in, in Xflow. Okay, that's a um, simple example, of course, that we use for testing purposes, but you can imagine that we can go farther than that as for this example, which is a stator, uh, electric stator, and we have heat source or source term read in Xflow from CST simulation, 
and then we can do thermal simulation with CHT, conjugate heat transfer um, in Exfil directly. Okay, of course here we're using as well the moving parts feature of Exfil. Good. Um, now let's move from simulation to geometry and of course we couldn't do uh, without trying to well integrate CATIA into, into Exfil. Um, what we're doing in this case is we are showcasing how we implemented the DS special library in our latest release of Xflow so that we can basically drag and drop cat part and cat products directly into our Xflow GUI. And as you can see, Xflow is able to read that file and then you can choose the quality of your surface and, and edges and then you create the geometry in Xflow. Uh, that is really, really useful because now you don't actually have to uh, well, export your geometry from CADIA to a different format in order to uh, import it in Xflow, uh, but you can do that directly. Um, so that's really reducing the CAD to CFD time to a minimum. Okay, let's go back to simulation after this small break on, on geometry handling and let's go for, well, probably my favorite code simulation, um, that's integration with Abacus. Uh, so now we are trying to do a two-way coupling within Xflow and a structure solver. And in this case, we are indeed trying to do a full two-way coupling where we exchange not only forces on a local point, but on a distribution on a surface, okay? For that, we are exploiting the Abacus code simulation engine and, well, Basically what happens is we're trying to exchange information on a surface. So we have forces coming from Abacus and the formation, sorry, from Xflow and the formation coming from Abacus and those are exchanged on this common surface. Um, how does Xflow handle the, the form um, surface? Well, for Xflow it's just a moving body so um, we can exploit the current capability of Xflow to handle those, those parts. We're going to see a little bit later on how that is, is done. So let me jump to some of the videos and validation that we did on this uh, specific development. And well, some people can remember we had a few coupling uh, a few years ago, a coupling with an external uh, structure solver, but that was limited for a uh, single phase simulation. Now with this new development, we basically have structure coupling with any solver that we have in Exflow. Uh, for example, on the top right side of the slides, you can see a coupling within the free surface solver of Xflow and Abacus. And you can see how the information actually transfer between the two solvers. So we have a dumb break with a flexible bar and those are interacting nicely on the right hand side. Okay, on the bottom side you can see the validation curve matching Xflow results with Abacus PFM results. So that's the displacement of the tip of the, of the bar. We also have, well, the same capability, of course, on single phase, and that's a typical benchmarking case, the Turek horn case. So where the vortex sheds from the cylinder are deforming the bar, and the bar itself is amplifying the vortex shedding. So it's a sort of a mutual interactor interaction. Um, you can see that the errors between codes, because that's as well a computational results, there is no experiment on that, are actually really small. So the simulation is really, really, really precise. Now those, of course, are simple validation cases, but now if you recall, we were talking about aqua planning and deformable tires. Now we can go even one step further. So not only the tire is actually deforming because it's got a contact with, with, the, with the ground, but it's also interacting with the fluid. So the fluid will exchange forces with the tire and we have this two-way coupling uh, simulation with Abacus X flow free surface. And that is really key if you want to do analysis on, for example, aqua planning or, uh, again, water management of, of tires, or if you want to do simulation with actual threads or the actual geometry of the tire. Okay, so that really opens up lots of new uh, simulation capabilities or um, possibility in, in actual free structure interaction. Okay, um, there was, all ahead on integration with DS products. Um, that was a quick overview.
but that's to give you an idea of what's coming from the from in the next release and now I really want to focus on the on the live demo so we'll take some time to show you what we're gonna do and we'll try to do a step-by-step -step, uh, setup and what we're gonna see it's actually a reduced case of the validation that we saw earlier so it's a flexible thumb break uh, bar coupling okay so we have the free surface on the left hand side of Xflow and some really nonlinear um, high deformable geometries in Abacus okay and we're gonna set up the case and I'm gonna show you what well, well, how to run the case in um, in Abacus and in Xflow and how the co simulation works so the key things to remember in this demo is that we are using the new developed co simulation CSE co simulation engine and it's a free surface simulation of course uh, we're gonna do a 3D simulation, although it looks like it's a 2D. It's just a 3D slice, okay? And we're using Abacus on the right-hand side, explicit dynamic, uh, large deformation formulation, of course, and nonlinear elements. Um, in theory, the coupling is developed for either explicit or implicit Abacus, so standard. Uh, but we are gonna focus on explicit simulation in um, in this demo, okay? So the use so you can actually explore different different setup. It's the co-simulation engine that takes care of um, the exchange between the two the two solver. Okay, so let me pause my presentation. Okay, and let me go and open up one of the Xflow window. So that's the new. Xflow 2017X, okay, uh, I did set a light color, so if you are seeing that um, in white instead of black, it's a different team. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an Xflow simulation of the dumb break, and at the same time, we're gonna set up the Abacus counterpart, okay. So let's start with Abacus first, and I'm gonna show you how to set up that, um, that quickly. So we start with defining our geometry first. Okay, we do just um, a part, so we create one. Okay, yeah, my dialog is probably on the wrong window. Yeah, let me check that. Okay. Create. Okay, and once we create the part in uh, Abacus, we're going to set up the XFLOW counterpart and we're going to set a internal simulation with the free surface solver. Okay, so let's do that again. Okay, 3D extrusion. Okay, and now we're going to try to set our section and if I recall correctly we have those values for the section which are 0 0.006 and 0 0.08 okay and if I do done okay 0 0.08 I think that should be my dimensions okay um, yeah I think it's a little bit too big on one side so I'm gonna recreate that 0 0.012 okay and let's do that quickly it's minus 0 0.006 and 0 0 0.006 and 0 0.08 Okay, and if I do that, perfect. And my depth is 0 0.012. Okay, so now that looks much better. Perfect. Now we have our geometry. Let me quickly set the material. And well, we're gonna define the density. And of course, some Young module. So elasticity, elastic, 
one yeah module and we set a zero percent ratio okay uh, it's nothing fancy it's just a simple elastic model now let's set our section and let's set this material and we apply the section to our geometry so now we're quickly setting um explicit simulation in abacus dynamic simulation okay and as you can see while well, i'm just creating in the bar i'm gonna now mesh it and then we'll export that and set that as um, geometry in Xflow, uh, structural geometry in Xflow. Okay, so that's my seeding and I want to mesh this part. So now I have a nice and uh, mesh 3D uh, bar and we can move to the next step. So the Airbus, uh, sorry, the um, Abacus users will be all familiar with what I'm doing at the moment, which is basically creating the Abacus model so nothing fancy so far. Uh, I'm gonna show later on two main settings that we need to keep mind on, which is um, interface and boundary conditions. Okay, so those are really important for the coupling of the two software. So now we have our assembly, and that's one of the steps which are, is important. So we have to define a surface, which is gonna be our exchange of information. Okay, so I'm gonna create one surface and that is going to be a mesh surface, not a geometry one, okay, because we're going to exchange information on the nodes of the actual uh, mesh. And I'll select the whole geometry in this case. And of course, we're going to have, well, the surface of all this 3D uh, mesh are going to be the one exchanging information with Xflow. Okay, so now I have my surface one, which is the uh, surface where we exchange data. Perfect. Now let's quickly define a new step. And that is going to be, as we said, a dynamic explicit. And I'm going to call that a co-simulation step. OK. Now the only thing I'm going to define here is the time period. And it's 0 0.5 second. It's going to be exactly the same in Xflow. So we're going to have two simulation. Um, whose duration is going to be 0 0.5 second and that is usually the case okay you want your structural and fluid dynamic simulation to be exactly on the same simulation time uh, good so now we have our step and that's step number two the user have to remember we need to create an interaction between the two software so create an interaction in, um, in Abacus and we're going to call that a coupling interaction and it's a standard explicit co-simulation coupling, okay? So I do that, and of course, I'm gonna select the surface I created earlier, so my surface one, okay? And now I have my interaction defined, and as you can see, uh, Abacus is picking all the nodes of my uh, mesh in 3D on the surface where I'm gonna exchange information with Xflow. Okay, so now I'm done. Just a few boundary conditions. Okay, of course I'm gonna set the base of this geometry to be constrained. So I'm gonna set an encast in there. And let's do that quickly. So that's my boundary condition one. And the second one I'm going to apply is actually a sort of a 2D displacement. So I'm going to select the remaining surfaces. I'm going to say, well, actually, you can move on the X, Y plane. OK, so not Z rotation. So not Z displacement and not X, Y rotation. OK, perfect. So now we're ready. So we have our setup in X, uh, sorry, in Abacus. Let's do, let's create a job and let's call that Xflow coupling. Okay, and let's keep the standard settings. I'm not gonna do anything fancy. And once we are here, we are ready to uh, run the co-simulation. So we're gonna write our input file for this Abacus um, 
simulation. So if you right click on the job and write input, now we have our input file and then we're going to use that to run our co-simulation. So that's set and probably the last step is to export this geometry. So let me do that quickly. Um, you have in plugins, tools, STL export. I'm going to export the geometry as an STL file uh, so then I can read that into Xflow and then I can use that uh, to specify where the bar is going to be. Okay, so let's do that live and let's call that bar. Perfect. So that's my export of the geometry completed and I'll do the setup in Xflow. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit quicker. Um, so it's going to be a free surface simulation and as we said it's an internal one and nothing strange in there. Perfect material, we're going to leave water as default and now I'm going to first create my domain which is going to be the exterior of my box that we seen earlier. Okay, 0 0.2 and that is going to be 0 and minus 0 0.006. So that's just the dimension of the exterior box, which is in there. Perfect. And now I'm going to read in the geometry I just exported. So the bar.stl. Okay. And as you can see, I read that in and it's my starting geometry. Okay. Perfect. So far so good. Um, now that's where the new thing come in. If you go back to environment in Xflow, now we have a structure analysis option, which is again available for uh, labs or expert mode. And we can select Abacus. And now we can select what's gonna be the host name. We're gonna have the co-simulation engine running. And that's the port that it's gonna use. Okay, by default it's 2045, uh, sorry, 2024. But you can select any port that you can use uh, for co-simulation. Okay, so that's one of the settings we need to change in Xflow is to select a specific structural analysis. And the next one is to set our bar geometry as actually a structural geometry. So instead of having a fixed behavior, that is going to be a structural behavior. Okay, so now Xflow will identify that, that the geometry is going to change over time and the input is going to be given from Abacus to Xflow. Okay, so if I visualize that, you can see that that's the exact mesh that we had in Abacus. Okay, and that is going to change over time. Perfect. So geometry is done. Uh, let me do a few other settings. And if I set a few boundary conditions, so on the sides, I'm actually going to set free slip boundary conditions. Okay, and that's because I don't want any friction on the side of the of my domain. So that is going to be instead of an automatic a free slip condition. Perfect. Okay, and then I'm going to specify an initial height for my liquid. So as you can remember from the video, we had some height of water that then collapses and crashes into the bar. So I'm going to specify that in here. And I'm going to use a Boolean function. So that's another powerful thing of Xflow. You can specify function directly in the function viewer and use that in the simulation. So that's going to be a Boolean between X and Y. So I'm just filling up the left hand side of my box. Perfect. So that is done. I have my boundary conditions and now I'm setting my simulation time that as we said is going to be the same in Abagus and Xflow, 0 0.5 second. I'm going to specify a custom time step in Xflow. And it's going to be a uniform resolution in this case. So my lattice is going to be all uniform and 1.2 millimeter. Perfect. We are ready. So now we have 
our simulation. So that's going to be 200. And I can save this one into the same folder where I saved my Abacus simulation. And let's call it Abacus demo. OK. And now I have two set up ready. Now, in order to actually execute the code simulation, um, we're going to have to do that in um, command line, but that's not a big deal. OK, so if I go back to my same folder where I had my uh, setups, set up, setup files, let me log in quickly. OK. We're going to launch first Xflow and then Abacus and then the co-simulation engine. So we're going to have three windows open, Xflow, Abacus, co-simulation, and we're going to see how to do each step. So first of all, we're going to generate the Xflow domain, which is the lattice discretization. So that's the discretization of the volume we're going to analyze. OK, that takes is completely automatic, so it takes a few seconds. And now we're going to execute the Engine 3D FS, FS, which is a free surface solver of Xflow. And as you can see, once you execute the solver, it's waiting for the co-simulation engine on a specific host name, on a specific port number. And that's what we did specify in Xflow in there. OK. Now we do exactly the same for Abacus. So we run our Abacus simulation. And as you can see, we're specifying again host name and port of the co-simulation engine. And that's the Xflow coupling.imp file that we created, the input file. OK, so once Xflow started, we start also Abacus. And both will be waiting for our co-simulation engine to start. So let's do that and let's start the co-simulation engine. And as you can see, it's an easy command. And again, we have the port number, which we specified earlier. So now Abacus is explicitly starting up. It's doing some preliminary settings, checking. Xflow is already connected to the co-simulation engine. So now it's waiting for Abacus to start. And once we have our simulation starting, now we have both sof software, Xflow and Abacus, communicating through the co-simulation engine. OK, so now the simulation is starting on the background. Um, we're going to see that, well, as you can see here, the simulation is advancing on time. And we have a synchronization point at each specific time step that the co-simulation engine uh, controls. OK, so that was the Xflow log. This one is the Abacus log file. And all of that is, well, handled by the co-simulation engine, which is easily set up using an XML file. And I'm going to show you quickly how that looks like. And that is delivered with the Xflow installation. So you can use the default settings. OK, and that is basically standard setup for the co-simulation engine. So the user doesn't have to modify that extensively, and then the simulation is running on the background. OK. Of course, what I'll do now is I'll show you the results, because we don't want to wait for the simulation to, to end. But as you can see, it's a really simple step, especially on the Xflow side. OK, it's just setting the Apacos settings on the environment, my structural geometry as, of course, a structural behavior. And that is basically it. OK, so let's do some post-processing quickly. And I'll show you the final results of this simulation on Xflow first and then on Abacus. So that's the exact same setup. But as you can see, now we have a complete simulation. So if I move on time and I show some of the steps, well, you can see that the geometry starts to deform, of course. And if I do set a few cutting planes here and there, you can see how the fluid interacts with the with the geometry. Okay, let me set that exactly as the video so you can see where the video comes from. Okay, and if I of course select a different time step or step in time where I saved my data, 
you're going to see that, well, our geometry is actually um, being deformed by the forces acting from the fluid side. Okay. Now, just for comparison, let's quickly open up the Abacus post-processing uh, so you can see exactly the same results that we see, saw in the video. So that's, again, the same setup we did earlier. And, and we're plotting more, more misses stresses on this case. And of course, if I play that, you're going to see basically the uh, deformation and the plots of the stresses on the abacus mesh. Okay, And of course, that's a result of acting forces from X-flow passed by to, to abacus. And of course, the deformation is passed to, to X-flow. OK, nice and easy. And that concludes the demo on the coupling. So let me quickly jump back to uh, the presentation and I'll show you again the final results. So we've seen how to set this simulation up, both in Abacus and in Nextflow. We've seen how to launch and execute the co-simulation engine to handle the synchronization between the two software. And you can see you can do the live post-processing both in Nextflow and Abacus as the simulation evolves, so you can try to identify what's going on um, while the simulation is actually evolving in time. Okay, and with that one, probably I'll leave five to ten minutes for questions, if there is any, so please feel free to ask anything that you've seen um, so far uh, on, the, on the presentation, or if you have any queries for the new release 2017X, we'll try to answer all the questions. If it's not possible, we'll then well, either email you back or send you the reply through our uh, contacts. And if you do have other email questions that can come up later after watching this webinar, please contact us on um, our uh, email address. Mm -hmm. You can contact Zaki on zaki.abiz at 3ds.com or myself on my personal email address as well. Okay, so thank you for watching. And Zaki, if you do have any questions yeah. for me, please let me know. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for presenting us uh, uh, what is new in Nextflow 2017X uh, release. And, uh, and thank you all for, uh, for sending us your questions and attending this webinar. Uh, I have already answered privately some, uh, some of your questions, uh, but we will take uh, here some uh, five minutes now to, to, to answer more questions. So the first question for you, Giuseppe, is, uh, is from someone who is may, may, maybe already using uh, Simulia products. So it's about, uh, uh, so exactly, does Xflow 2017X use the license manager of Dassault system? I think he means uh, this DCLS license manager. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Um, we did implement the DSLS um, license uh, scheme. So for this release, 2017X, we have the two option, RLM, which is our current scheme, and the DSLS one. Now, that is uh, totally true for Linux. Uh, unfortunately, we do realize that, well, after the uh, um, delivery of the package of Xflow uh, installation that in Windows there is a problem of, well, basically between the two license server. So the DSLS is not working for Windows, but it's per perfectly fine for Linux. We already fixed that, so for the next patch release, we're going to have DSLS for both um, OS for both the um, Linux and Windows options, okay? Good, okay, Th thank you for, for this answer. Uh, another question is more uh, more technical question on uh, one of uh, the first fe features you, you, you presented. Uh, okay, let me just uh, find the, the question. Yeah, uh, can you explain the physics uh, behind the temperature jump boundary condition? Can you explain more about uh, the physics? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so the condition is basically trying to set a boundary jump or a temperature jump through a surface. Um, so in this case, what we're trying to do is mimic if you have, for example, a heat source applied or if you have some sort of cooling system or heat exchanger, instead of actually solving that using a fine lattice resolution or a fine discretization, you can mimic that with a surface. Uh, so it's a thin surface, it doesn't take very long to compute, and then we're applying a delta temperature. Um, in the specific case, we are setting 50% of the temperature lower on one side and 50% upper on the other side. So the delta is spread between the two sides. And as you can see well from the video, one side is cool and the other one is 
speed it up in a way, okay? So that's the idea where you could use that. Instead of solving a really thin surface with a, lots of lattice elements, you could try to use that as a close approximation, let's say. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, another question. Uh, just m maybe one or two questions more and we will uh, finish this uh, session. So one question is about uh, the 3D Express platform. If Xflow is or Xflow 2017X is available on this platform? Okay, um, not yet on the 3DX um, directly, uh, but we do work on a power buy option. So um, what happens? Well, we have a sort of uh, interface system between Xflow standalone and uh, the 3DX uh, platform, and you can basically access the data model of the 3D platform, 3DX platform from Xflow through what we call the Power BI option. So the data model will be read into Xflow. So you're going to have the geometry that comes from the 3DX platform. You're going to have your simulation. Your system will, of course, record and have a tagging of the geometry that you're using. And then you can upload the results on the 3DX platform as well. So you're going to always have an associated set of results for your uh, geometry. So this way you can keep track basically of um, what geometry has been simulated and what's the results, but still you do not have a graphical user interface of Xflow, let's say on the 3DX platform or well, for this release. Of course, that's the long-term uh, development and we're working toward that, but in the meantime, we offer this Power by solution uh, to well, the user that can uh, use the 3DX platform already. Okay, so maybe the, the last question. Uh, which are the software that could be connected to Xflow via FMI standard? Okay, um, as I said earlier, it's a sort of a standard, open standard, so many software implement the same format or the same standard. Um, we've done that with, well, previously with um, MSC Adams, for example, another multi-body solver. Uh, we've done tests with um, MATLAB or OpenModelica. So all these software, they implement the same FMI standard and they can be a master in the process can be used with Xflow. And for the full list, probably the best way to do is to go to the website, um, uh, OpenFMI, they try to have a sort of a list of software tested with the current version of um, FMI standard, so you can have an idea of what solver can actually be plugged into Xflow. Um, that's the most updated list that you can get is from the actual website of FMI developers. Okay. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for answering the questions. I think uh, we'll stop uh, here for this uh, webinar. Uh, please, if you have uh, more questions, you can send them uh, to me or to Giuseppe by email. Uh, we will try to, to answer them after the webinar. You And um, OK, thank you. So thank you to everyone who has attended this webinar. I inform you that this webinar has been uh, recorded, so uh, you will receive an email notification tomorrow uh, as soon as the recording is uploaded. This way you can review the webinar and uh, share it anytime you need. Uh, so thank you again to everyone and have a, have a nice day. Thank you, Giuseppe, also. Perfect. Thank you, Zagi. And thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye.